Hello and welcome to the PhD Life Rive podcast. I'm Emma Brzezinski and today I'm talking to Emily Roberts, who has a specialism in helping PhD students with financial issues. And in this episode, we talk about the particular challenges that PhD students might face. We also talk about mindset issues and how to understand what's going on for you and how to make changes in that. So I do hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, Emily. Hi, so thank you so much for um, inviting me. Thank you so much for being on this call at seven o'clock in the morning, your time. That it's is my truly pleasure. amazing. <laughs> um, so this, I, I um, came across you because I was looking for someone to talk about um, the financial challenges of doing a PhD. And I, ca- I came across your work and what I loved was it came out of your own experience. So you went through this process and you learned from it, and now you are helping other people in that situation. Um, so thank you for coming and and being willing to share that experience. Um, and we always start with um, asking people about their own experience with the PhD. So uh, that's a good place to start then. <laughs> so t- can you tell us a little bit about your own experience with the PhD? How that led you into thinking about um, this this kind of financial arena. Absolutely. And I, I do think I need to start a little bit back from, you know, Please the say. actual start of the PhD. Um, so I, as you can tell from my accent, I'm based in the U.S. Um, and so I have always lived in the U.S. I grew up in Northern Virginia, went to college in California. Um, and then I did a post back year Um, between when I finished college and when I started graduate school, and I went straight into a PhD program eventually. Um, During that post-bac year, I was being paid essentially what I, around what I would be paid in graduate school, sort of the same kind of stipend level. And I- Can I, oh, sorry, can mm -hmm? I just ask what a post-bac year is? Because I I haven't heard of that before. (laughs) Yeah, of course. Um, Not everyone, it's it's not everyone here would know what it is either. So a post-bac is basically um, a year of additional um, training and getting ready to go to graduate school. Okay. So you finish your bachelor's degree, you're planning on going to graduate school, and it's just another year of- you know, further strengthening, shoring up whatever weaknesses you may have. So there's different flavors of postbacs, and it's actually a little bit more common in for people who are going into medical doctorates. Right. Um, so right. it'll be like, oh, someone who's maybe majored in not biology or a biology related field, maybe they have a few extra classes they need to take. So they finish their bachelor's, but they do a post back to, you know, get those extra classes in and, and take their MCATs and do all that. But it's in the, it's on the PhD side as well. And okay. there's different kinds of post back programs. The one I did was at the National Institutes of Health. And so it specifically took, again, you know, people just finished with their bachelor's, you did a fellowship for one or two years, very research intensive um, at, at the NIH. And then during that time, you apply to P- either a PhD program or an MD program. It was nice. about 50, 50. So, um, I say that to say at that, you know, in that year, I was sort of freed from the academic pressures of college and graduate school. Um, and I had a lot of free time. I basically worked, you know, kind of a 40 hour work week and had the rest of the time to myself, which is so novel after, (laughs) you know, the, the undergraduate education I'd just been through. So I say that to say, you know, I got to that point and I was, I was receiving this stipend and I was living in the DC area, which is relatively expensive. And I did not really know anything about money. <laughs> like I was not <laughs> real sure how I was supposed to live on that stipend in nice. that particular nice. cost of living area. Um, and also more background about me. I'm like an oldest child. So I'm very like sort of responsible and like, I don't know, I want to do the right thing. And so I wanted to learn what was I supposed to be doing with my money? Because I did not grow up in a family where money was discussed. Nice. Um, I was nice. sort of middle-class family. We had enough. There was not you know, scarcity or, or want necessarily, but it also was just sort of a 
topic of tension. And so it was not, I was not taught anything. It was just not something that was discussed in our family. Nice. Um, so I got to that point and I really didn't know what to do. <laughs> and so I started reading books, right? Cause that's my, that's my kind of solution is I just, that I know something I'm going to pick up a book. Um, so I started reading personal finance books. And so the journey for me started there um, at the beginning of my post back year. And then it continued. I spent six years doing my PhD. So basically that seven year period of post back into the PhD program, I just kept learning more and more about personal finance um, through, through books. And then eventually like the online space, this was, I started my PhD in 2008, finished in 2014. So this was like great recession kind of time. Mm. And this topic was so um, in the four, right? It was just something that a lot of people were talking much more about than they had in the past online. And so I started participating in like the personal finance blogosphere. I started a blog, not my current website, but a predecessor, um, and just talking and talking more about personal finance. And through that journey, again, over many years, I realized that uh, no one was really focusing on me and my peer group, that is graduate students and early career PhDs, um, and sort of tailoring the personal finance content for that group. And I realized when I finished my PhD that I was way more passionate about doing that than I was about continuing my actual research. <laughs> So that in brief is how I got to starting my business, personal finance for PhDs in 2014, instead of actually uh, using my degree in a direct manner. Well, I, I love it because so many people that we've, we've um, had come on have taken a different route after the PhD than the one that perhaps they thought they were going to when they started. Um, but but always it's about passion and you're finding that passion um, and what a gorgeous gift then that PhD journey was to to take you into to the passion that you now have for, for what you do. Um, I think so. And I, and I get to serve my peers, as I said earlier, you know, and, and, um, and I'm, I'm of that group. I mean, that's why you invited me on the podcast. So like people are in some ways able to listen to me, I think, and hear me in a different way mm. when I talk about kind of, you know, I might talk about the same stuff that other people in the personal finance space do, but coming from someone who's been through the PhD process and even now, like, yes, I went through it myself, but I had, I had one <laughs> experience with the PhD and now through my business and all these years later, I've heard so many other stories. And I've talked with so many other PhDs and graduate students. That I have a much you know, broader view of what's going on during the PhD, um, which is a great benefit. So I have my personal experience, but I also have just people just talk to me about this now because I'm, I'm open to it. Yeah. And I think it is such an important element um, that doesn't get talked about very much. Actually, it really resonated with me when you said, you know, your family didn't talk about it. So people don't really talk about it because it's a thing that we don't talk about. It's not polite, but it also it, it's it can be really fundamental on somebody's PhD journey, that financial pressure. So I wonder whether then we can just check in with because I know you have a very wide understanding of personal finance, but these this this kind of particular challenges um for PhD students. Yes. Um you know, you, before we started this interview, were just kind of briefing and updating me on the the typical system in the UK for doing PhDs. And honestly, it sounds, um, it sounds brutal financially. Brutal. Um, so many restrictions on the financial side and on the time management side. Mm. Um, I'll just say that. So yes, there, there are multiple different kind of pressures going on. Um, as an overview, I would say the most important ones to consider are opportunity cost. Um, the, the, financial, mental, and physical damage that having a low pay, you know, kind of poverty level wages mm. or close to it um, can inflict. Um, and then the mindset uh, damage that can happen sort of when you're, when you've been through the PhD experience or spent some time in academia, um, it can really affect your, your money mindset in a way that will linger with you potentially for many years afterwards. So I would say those are the big three and I'm happy to talk about them further. Please do. Please do. They, they all sound super juicy. Tell, tell, tell me more. Okay. So opportunity cost um, is basically. What does that mean? I, I love, the, love <laughs> yes. the title, but I don't know what it means. Yes. So basically what it means is that when you choose to do a PhD um, and you agree to whatever the level of funding, if there's any funding, 
um, during that time, you are not only um, you're you're losing out on the salary you would have had had you you know gone a different route and kept working or whatever the case is. So it's the opportunity cost of the the salary difference um, during those years, whether you've gone to a reduced salary or or down to zero or down to negative if you're drawing down your savings. Mm -hmm. There's that opportunity cost of the salary, but then you have to layer on top of that the opportunity cost um, involved with compound interest. So when we're thinking about our long-term finances and, you know, going towards um, building wealth and and funding our retirement or paying off debt or whatever our financial goals are, um, compound interest comes into play, which is basically just that your money is worth more now than it will be in the future. And you can grow your money because you can grow your money over time. And also there's inflation that eats away at the purchasing power of your money over the decades. So putting away a little bit of money when you're younger towards investments, for example, can make a big, big, big difference in your net worth in your older years when you're getting ready for retirement. Um, And so there's the opportunity cost, not only of the salary, but of the lost years of saving and investing, or conversely, if you have debt that you're trying to pay down, if that's your situation, then it's lost opportunity to pay down debt during those years. And compound interest just intensifies the, the opportunity cost. That makes a lot of sense and also makes me feel a bit sick in my tummy. (laughs) But yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yes. So I think, you know, the important thing, one of the important things, one of the important messages I want to get to your listeners, especially those who have not yet started the PhD, um, is just to really recognize what you're getting into when you commit to this. Because there's so much, I mean, there are great reasons to do a PhD. You mentioned passion earlier. That's the main one, just loving a subject area and wanting to further your career and making sure you're going to have the kind of career you want in that area, making an impact on your field. Those are wonderful reasons to do a PhD. Um, but you just have to look at the other side, at the opportunity cost, um, mm-hmm. at what you're going to give up to do it and make sure it's worth it for you. And if you decide it is, then when you experience some of the costs, like the opportunity cost of doing a PhD, um, at least you'll be kind of prepared for it. <laughs> you know, you'd be yes. kind of mentally braced for it and say, you know what, I thought about it. It's worth it for sure. X, Y, Z reasons, I'm doing it. Um, but just just to be aware, because it, what's really, really tough is when you get, you know, one, two, three years into this process, you're not quite done yet. And somehow those negative or downsides to doing the PhD have kind of overwhelmed the positives Mm. and you just, you have such sunk costs at that point, you know, do you continue? Do you leave? It's a really heart wrenching decision. And so if you can do as much preparation as you can going into the process, that's, it's, it's so much better just to have, again, your eyes kind of wide open and aware of all of the, the upsides and the downsides of going into it. Yes. Cause we were talking a little bit, as you said, before we started recording and talking about, you know, sometimes it is just a better idea to write the book, just write your book rather than do the PhD and to really think about what it is you're trying to get out of that process, what it is that you're entering into. Um, But let's assume then that people have looked at that and they have decided this is, this is really what I want to do. This is right. Um, So they've got that, that opportunity cost. Then what was the the next thing that you were saying? I remember. Yes. So the the damage that's inflicted yes. by having <laughs> Let's go on either to damage because that's yeah. cheerful. <laughs> the damage that's inflicted both to your finance to your finances to your physical and mental health um, that can happen during the process. So if you are you know funding yourself and you are either drawing down savings or you're working and trying to balance you know earning money with working on your dissertation. Um, mm. And, and still there's not much money. Like there's just not much money to go around. There's actual, you know, when you're living in poverty, there's this mental, um, fog that comes into your mind and you literally cognitively are not able to function at the same level if you're living in poverty versus if you did not have financial stress in your life. Mm -hmm. And somehow academia has decided that it's a good idea to inflict that fog on their trainees, like literally at the time when they're supposed to be doing this fabulous academic work. Mm -hmm. Um, Yet it comes with this, you literally are not able to function at your highest level because of financial stress. 
I don't, yes. it's baffling to me that we, that we do this to, <laughs> to our trainees, to our young. Um, oh, so okay, yes, there's yes. literal, you know, financial damage that happens as I mentioned the opportunity cost earlier, but then, you know, when, and many of your listeners may be in this situation, you're actually trying to live on the funding that you have, or yes. again, you're trying to work uh, maybe as little as possible to get just enough money, but still devote most of your time to your research. Um, living in that way, you know, you can make sacrifices um, again to your physical health, for instance, by, you know, not taking the time to be, you know, sleeping enough and getting exercise. Maybe it's that you're not eating enough food or you're not eating the right kinds of food to be fueling your body properly. Mm. Um, similarly in the mental health side, I mean, I just mentioned just the stress, the stress that comes from the financial pressure, um, can compound and, and then maybe you're not even getting access to Well, I'm speaking from a U.S. perspective because maybe you wouldn't go to therapy, um, because it costs money to go to therapy and you can't, don't have that right now. Um, so, you know, it can all just kind of come together in this like soup of like damage to various different aspects to, of your life. Um, when you're when you're in the thick of it like that. And I think it's really important to recognize it um, because I think, as we talked about, you know, you, you come to the PhD for the life of the mind. You have this this project that you're passionate about and you, you want to explore this. And there's this whole thing, I think, of, you know, kind of artists living in a garret and just kind of getting on with it. But actually, as you say, it can be incredibly stressful and it can be really it can actually prevent you from doing your best work and so it is really worth kind of being honest with yourself addressing it talking to um talking to your supervisors about it too um because you know this is this is um can really be detrimental yeah yeah um, i think i i mean the that image that you just brought up of like you know the the artist's life um it, it's such a a myth I guess yes. oh totally like it's it's just it's not like okay artists had like patrons <laughs> like they had people giving them money to do work like you you cannot do your work without money you cannot and the idea that um that one could exist in this like uh blissful state of not being concerned about finances yet not really making that much money is just completely it's just completely false absolutely um and then you, the last thing you were saying was about mindset and the, the kind of your the money mindset and the way that academia um, can twist that for you. Yes. So I think um, the mindset thing is especially um, impactful. Like so, so academia like tells you things about money, just sort of like in a mother culture kind of way, it just whispers in your ear some things about money, like what we were just talking about. Oh, the life of the mind. That's the only thing that's important. You know, ignore money. You don't need it. Don't care about it. Um, it's, it's evil to chase after money, you know, capitalism, you know, these kinds of messages come from different corners of academia. Um, and, and they can really have an impact, I would say, especially for a young person who's pursuing a PhD who maybe doesn't have a, a whole lot of experience um, in, in the working world, hasn't had a whole lot of time to develop their own ideas about money. You know, maybe they come from a family background, you know, your family tells you about money, impart certain mindsets on you, but academia can as well, especially if it's coming at this really, you know, influential time in your life, you know, maybe in your 20s and your early adulthood. Um, so you can develop certain, it's typical to develop certain, um, unhelpful mindsets around money. I mean, there may be some helpful ones too, but we're focusing on the, you know, the, the difficulties here. Scarcity mindset is when you believe that there's never enough to go around of whatever resource it is. Um, and scarcity is real in academia. It's real in, in the job side, right? It's absolutely real. It's real on the financial side, but you can carry a scarcity mindset uh, forward into a situation in your career or in your finances where where there is not actual scarcity, but you feel and perceive that there is scarcity um, oh, because of that mindset. Rife. It is just rife. I I I am started to set myself a little challenge because I noticed how many times I would say with students, you know, in 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 a teaching situation, well, we've only got this, you know, we're running out of time now, and it's kind of like that's right, just kicking it off right there in terms of going we have this time together there is the you know kind of really I think academia absolutely feeds a scarcity mindset absolutely there's not yes, enough time be, there's not enough jobs mm -hmm. there's not enough resources there's not enough yeah absolutely 
Yeah, yeah. It can cause you to make um, different kinds of decisions than you would if you were operating under a different mindset. And it can ultimately, again, sort of damage different things like your time management skills or your financial management skills. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, if you feel scarcity, if you perceive scarcity in your finances, you know, maybe you don't take risks that you would otherwise in your finances. Maybe you don't, well, as I've done, you know, start a business, for example, someone with a scarcity mindset would likely not go that route. They want to be safe. Um, yes. They want to go with the safe route. Yes. Um, maybe you don't do investments because you feel that you want to, you know, just hoard your cash as much as you possibly can. You have to have a larger and larger and larger emergency fund and you won't go into the world of investing because it feels too risky. Mm. Um, so these are some things that can happen with a scarcity mindset that's carried on beyond the time when it's useful. Because mm. for a time it may be useful to feel that there is scarcity when there is literal, literal scarcity around you. It makes sense. But to carry it forward when there's not any longer can really hold you back in some ways. And then the other mindset that I wanted to point out um, is called anchoring. And so that's when, for example, you get um, you get anchored, you get accustomed to the kind of salary you're making either you know through your funded PhD or maybe from the part-time work you're doing during your PhD. You're, you're anchoring yourself at that kind of salary and saying, this is what I'm worth, this is what I deserve. And then when you finish the PhD and you have these you know, wonderful career opportunities in front of you, whether inside or outside of academia, um, you can go forward and saying, oh, wow, they're going to pay me double? What I was making during my PhD, triple, whoa. And you can feel so, um, you know, flattered and everything. But the thing is that you were anchored at a salary that was far, far, far too low. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't, it really sort of um, confuses you understanding what your worth is in other settings outside of the PhD student setting. Wow. So we've, we've set out all the problems <laughs> um, and we've made ourselves feel depressed, but there's the, but there are, there are ways out of this. And I just, can you tell us how, how do you support people? What strategies are there out there for people to, to, if, if they recognize any of that going on for them, what, what can they do? Uh, yes, it may not seem like it from, you know, the interview so far, but I am actually a pretty positive and optimistic person, <laughs> um, especially, especially with respect to PhD finances. I am. So I, um, I, I'll point out before I get started in this, I, I would say, first of all, there needs to be systemic change within academia, as I was saying earlier, yes. to better support the trainees. Yes. Yes. Um, that absolutely is necessary. And it's, it's shocking to me, the, the more I go into this, that it, it hasn't happened decades ago, but there is systemic change that is needed. However, uh, my specialty is on the side of what can I do personally as an individual to better my own financial situation, given the system that I'm working within right now. And I certainly encourage you, um, if you're so inclined towards activism or policy to work towards change in the system, absolutely. My specialty is more on the what can I do as an individual um, for myself kind of mm -hmm. side of things. So that's what I'll talk about. But I want to have that caveat up front that, of course, work towards changing the system as well. But at the same time, take care of yourself. Yes. Yes. So so some top tips then for, for what people can do for themselves. Yes. So I think the first one, and this is for people who are going into the PhD who have not yet committed to that kind of uh, program yet is to maybe, you know, think outside the box a little bit about how you could do the PhD. Um, think seriously about where you want to do it. Um, do you want to do it in the UK where you live? As I said earlier, it sounds like you guys have a really, really tough system. Um, maybe going to another country is going to be, have a little bit more rosy of an outcome for you financially. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean you have to live there permanently. Of course, you can immigrate back. Um, but think about, you know, seriously about doing your PhD in Europe, I would say, because they have a totally different system where, or I'm speaking generally, it's probably not everywhere, but for example, Sweden, um, they very well support their graduate students. It's basically like you have a regular kind of job with proper pay and proper benefits and you do it within three years and you're treated like, like a, a fully fledged, you know, professional with respect. Um, and even in the U S it seems like there might be a little bit more leeway to have a better funded PhD experience potentially than you have in the UK. So seriously consider that. And I know not, that's not possible or attractive for everyone. So that's okay. But I just want you to think about it a little bit going into the process. Hmm. Um, so where are you going to do your PhD? Very, very important. Um, another thing, if you do decide to, you know, stick with stick in the UK for your PhD, um, how are you going to fund it? 
And, you know, I'm learning that getting funding for your PhD is highly, highly competitive. So you probably can't uh, count on it necessarily, or at least, you know, until you know whether you've received it or not. So you again have to prepare, I think, in different ways. It actually a little bit reminds me of starting a business, like maybe doing the PhD is analogous to starting a business, except it's over, you know, three years instead of hopefully a, a shorter time frame for starting a business. But what I mean by that is that when you start a business um, from sort of scratch, it may take quite a long time to ramp up your income streams and mm-hmm. you may need to make an investment in the business to, to do so. And so what people normally, I don't know about normally, but what's advisable for people to do at the start of a business is to kind of bootstrap it. Like while you're still working, um, you know, build up savings, build up a runway so that when you take off with your business, you have savings behind you to help bolster you through that beginning part of the process. So the analogy to the PhD would be, um, if you're not sure if funding is going to come through, then what can you do savings wise in the years leading up to when you start the PhD to you know, build up savings so you can supplement whatever income you might have during the PhD up to a livable level. Um, d- does that make sense? So like really, really like work before you get into the PhD like process on building up your financial security with that specific goal in mind. So lots and lots of, it sounds like lots and lots of cash savings would be the most appropriate way to go. And then if it turns out you do get funding, which would be lovely, um, then maybe you can make some investments with that cash savings instead of using it towards your living expenses during the PhD. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, so th- this is about that, that preparatory, that preparatory work. Um, any t- this is a very unfair question, I know, but any tips if people are already in it um, and are kind of thinking, I'm really, I'm really struggling at the moment and I'm not quite sure what the, what the smart thing is to do um, in terms of, do you know? Do I get another job? What do I do? Any thoughts on that? It's yes. not a fair question. It, I know. No, <laughs> it, it is a fair question because the thing is, like you know, um, there's the advice like uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, kind of thing. So we just talked about the ounce of prevention, but now we need yeah. to talk about the pound of cure too yeah. because that absolutely, you know, um, is where this episode is going to be beating many people. Mm. Um, so once you're in the thick of it. I like to think about both sides of the equation of, you know, to make your, to make your budget balance, to be in the black at the end of every month, what can you do to increase your income and what can you do to decrease your expenses? I do find that uh, maybe it's people generally, but I definitely see this among PhD students. They have an inclination to go to one side or the other. How can I increase my income so that I don't have to worry so much about, you know, keeping my expenses in check or how do I, you know, frugalize, frugalize, frugalize my life so that I don't have to worry about increasing my income at all. Um, And I would just say, look at both sides of the equation there and see what tweaks you can make to both of them to make the whole situation a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Um, On the, I I personally am inclined towards the decreasing expenses side of the equation, which is a little bit dangerous because you can only decrease your expenses so far, right? Mm -hmm. Realistically, they can only go down so far. There's a certain minimum (laughs) that's going to happen. But on that side of the, um, on that side of things, the typical, you know, largest expenses for a PhD student um, are housing, transportation, and food. And so I like to talk about housing first off, because as a typically a fixed expense, housing is something where if you can manage to decrease your rent, usually, if you can manage to decrease that, um, and I know it takes a lot of work and potentially a lot of money actually to move, um, a lot of preparation. But if you can manage to do it, it literally pays off every single month with reduced expenses without you having to exert any willpower, any kind of effort to maintain that reduction. This is as opposed to when you try to reduce a variable expense like uh, food, for example. Mm. Um, It's, you know, again, that can only go down so far. But let's say you were like going to slash your eating out budget, you know, eating out and coffee and and alcohol. You were just, no, I'm not going to do any of that now. I have to save this money. I have to frugalize my life. Um, It's very easy to make that cut in the first place because it's a variable expense and discretionary, but it's very, very difficult to sustain that over the long term because 
just as, e- as it was easy to turn it off, it's easy to turn it back on. You know, you just have to have a momentary lapse right, in your, right. you know, will of steel <clears throat> and, you know, you've blown the budget, right? Um, and also because a lot of times those, you know, variable and small and discretionary expenses are what gives a bit of flavor to our life, a bit of enjoyment, you know, some some relief and joy throughout the day. And so just psychologically, it's um, very, very difficult, if not impossible, to make that kind of cut um, over the long term. So maybe you can do it for a month or two, but it's just not sustainable really for a long time. So that's why I like to focus more on the fixed expenses, um, like housing, mm-hmm. um, like transportation, potentially, if you had like a car loan, you know, maybe you can reduce that or like get rid of the car or something like that. Um, so I'd like to focus on those fixed expenses more. Utilities often are fixed expenses. You know, maybe you can shop around for different providers. I don't know. Depends on where you live, what the situation mm-hmm. is. But yeah, I like to focus first on fixed and then go to variable and also large, larger first than smaller ones when you're looking at your budget. I love it. That's so much wisdom in there. And um, yeah, a lot to think about. Thank you so much, Emily, for being here um, and for all that fantastic information. And thank you for listening. Yeah, you are so welcome. Thank you for having me. 